starting for the children's team. Thinks he can run the 40 yard dash, but no. Takes him an hour. Ifeodua OKDG. Standing at three foot six inches tall, says she wants to be a mermaid, but she can't even swim. Addison Webb. Standing at three feet, one inch, and his brother, a little taller, three foot two inches tall. They can't even make their mother laugh. My sons, Paul and Timothy Weak Sauce Porter. I would say something mean, but she would probably cry. Standing at one foot three inches tall, my daughter Reese Donaldson. My kids think they're funny. They're not. They're not at all. Beckham, big shot starling. In London, bad attitude starling. Starting for the pastor's team. He goes hunting, but always comes back empty handed. My dad, Pastor David Donald. Standing for the other team. My dad, Mr. Googly Eyes. Standing at four foot five, weighing at 450 pounds. Thinks he's good at video games, but he always comes in last. Pastor Matt Porter. Only benching the bar. Doesn't go on walks with his family and blames it on his knee. Pastor Ade, AKA the Nigerian Nightmare. They say we look alike, but I have hair. Golf's every week, but still is no good. Our dad, Pastor Adam Starling. Did you hear Steve Harvey and his wife got in a fight? It was a family feud. <laughs> I won't spit very much, just a little bit. Why do you ducks have feathers on their tails? <laughs> Don't spit it in my eyes! Oh, I'm sorry. You covered their butt. Quack. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. It's good to see you here. Hopefully you get to walk around out there, check out the cars. I uh, drove my truck today. It's got almost 200,000 miles on it. I have my work gloves in there. It's dirty and all messed up. I almost put my work gloves in my back pocket just to come out and preach on. It's a great day to be a dad, is it not? It's great to be a dad. Can we do this? Can we honor our pastors, our pastors Adam and Christy Starling today? We love them. Pastor Adam is here. He's floating around just kind of trying to be a normal dad today and check everything out himself. Keep an eye on him. I want to know if he tries the root beer floats. He doesn't strike me as a root beer float guy, but I don't know, maybe he could be. I'm interested. If you catch him, maybe you can catch a, like, snap a picture of your phone uh, or snap a picture with your phone. I want to see that. Well, my name is Doug Everard. I want to introduce my family to you just on the screen. This is an older picture, and I'll explain why this is in just a second. That's my wife, Jill. Uh, we are both on staff here at the church. That's my oldest son, Seth. Obviously, he was a lot younger then. He just turned 22. He's the junior high pastor here at Victory Family Church. <clears throat> But I want to draw your attention to our youngest son. This is Grayson. And Grayson was diagnosed with a softball-sized tumor in his tummy a little over 10 years ago. And I want to share that story and that journey of our family with you today. And really, it's a story and a journey of faith. And so I want to jump right into this today. The text is on the screen. I'm going to read this. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And then we're going to take off 
and go. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for this day. Thank you for fathers all across this place. Lord, thank you for dads. Lord, right now in this moment, I pray that um, we learn how to trust you more fully today, no matter what happens in our life. We bless you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does it take to be a great dad? We settled on three things. I suppose you could change this list yourself if you want to do that. You, you being a dad, feel free to do that. But the three things that I settled on was, number one, you have to have some wrestling moves. Uh, you never know when your kid is going to jump on your back. So you got to have a strong back. you got to be ready to go. you got to be ready to wrestle. Now, my son is 22. He's a giant human being now. I appreciate the fact that he does not jump on my back anymore. But we do have a swimming pool. And this time of year. In fact, I think it was last week and we have a little basketball goal by the pool. And so we play basketball. We're a basketball fan. We love basketball. But I, every time we do this, we get in the pool. I promise you it turns into a wrestling match. So even at the age of 22, I'm still wrestling my son. I'll turn 50 in July and thankfully I can still do that. But I was thinking about that. that well, we did I, I guess it's actually a lot more dangerous because there's water and you could actually drown. Um, but nonetheless, leave it up to guys to make something more dangerous. So wrestling moves is number one. Number two, you have to have tools. Now, I know, wives, I understand that your husband already has too many tools. Um, but you need tools. Okay, you don't have to have a lot of them, and I understand most of us have a lot of them. We could probably spread them out and still have enough. But you at least need to have a couple tools. Um, duct tape and, uh, uh, what is that called? I just drew a blank. WD-40. Now, those really aren't tools, but they fix everything, so you've got to have those. And then I would recommend some crescent wrenches because you can adjust those suckers, probably some vice grips, uh, any assortment of screwdrivers, hammers, uh, you know, whatever your favorite tool is. But uh, wrestling moves tool. And then I think the last thing you need is a look. It's the look that doesn't say anything, or you don't have to say anything, you just look at them and it says everything, right? So let's do this right now. So dads, look over at your family and just give them the look. I know, you hate being put on the spot, but every dad has got the look. But I think, I think maybe one of the most important things that a great dad, or should I say a godly dad, needs is faith. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Faith is something we talk a lot about in church. And the scripture tells us what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Being a dad takes faith. It takes faith to trust that the things you deposit into your kids, advice, wisdom, direction, will pay off in the long run one day. It takes faith to trust that the moments of correction that aren't easy, and they're never easy, will stick with your kids for years to come. It takes faith to believe that even in seasons where your kids wander, that they will come back home. Being a dad who's trying to raise kids who love God, being a dad who's trying to help their kids navigate the ever-shifting culture, and listen, folks, this culture moves fast. Being a dad whose kids are grown and out of the house and having families of their own, all of it takes a ton of faith. But it's not just being a dad. Everything that the Lord calls you and I to will require faith. Marriage takes faith, right? 
I've been married to my wife for 29 years, and I guarantee if she was sitting in here right now, she would stand up and say, Amen, brother. <laughs> Being a parent in general requires faith. Starting a business or moving to a new job requires faith. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 says this in verse number 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to have faith. But therein lies the problem. I'm going to say some things which I believe a lot of us think, but we don't actually speak because we feel like we're not showing faith or a lack of faith is what we're showing. But I think this is probably where most of us are. And maybe we can put a little bit different spin and definition of what faith really is. The problem is I think we struggle really to understand what faith is. Now, I did not grow up in church. I got saved at the age of 17 in a youth group and started going to church on my own without my family. But I've been in church now long enough. I've heard a ton of messages on faith, and I've been a part of preaching those messages as well. But this idea that faith was a secret formula to get what I want from God, I think I really believe that. Here's some other things that I think I've really wrestled with over the years. That if there's something that I want God to do for me, then I have to muster up enough faith. And if I can muster up enough faith, then God will do what I want him to do. I have to have faith to be healed. If I'm not healed, it means I didn't have enough faith, right? If I want God to provide for my needs, I better have faith. And if somehow I fall behind on my bills, it's because I didn't have enough faith faith. I think sometimes we really believe those things. Now, I want you to do another exercise. Everybody has this. If you don't, just pretend you do. But I suspect everybody does. Think about the one thing, item, whatever it is, that you always wanted that your parents refused to buy for you. What is that item? Think back. You can tell your spouse there, whatever that item is. Mine was Ralph Lauren polo shirt. I grew up in the 80s and all the cool kids were wearing Ralph Lauren polo and my father worked in finance and so he saved all his money and I'm thankful for that. But at the time I was not because I just wanted to buy me a Ralph Lauren polo shirt. I probably have too many today out of a rebellious heart because they wouldn't buy them. But nonetheless, that was my item. The reality was is that maybe I just didn't have enough faith. Maybe you didn't have enough faith because if you and I had more faith, then the clerk at the store would have hand delivered the item to our door free of charge if you and I just simply had more faith. I was teasing my wife in the last service she was in there and I, I didn't ask her this, but I looked over, I said, I think yours was a horse, wasn't it? And she got really excited because I actually remembered something in our marriage. <clears throat> And then I looked at her, I said, well, I don't blame your parents. That's a huge commitment for buying a horse. My, mine was just a shirt. <laughs> so often we make faith about the end result. We talk about it like it's the secret power that I have to have in order to get what I desired from the Lord. And then when we don't get what we desired, right, our prayers aren't answered like they thought they would be. It leaves us disappointed, maybe in despair, um, wondering if there's something wrong with me or maybe something wrong with you. And honestly, ultimately, maybe questioning if God is even real. Does he even care? And quite honestly, those are some of the real thoughts that we have as human beings today. What if faith was less about the end result and more about the journey? What if faith wasn't a superpower that enabled us to get what we want but it was a gift that the Lord desires for us to grow into. Being a dad takes faith, following Jesus takes faith, and maybe it's way less complicated than what we've made it out to be. In Matthew 24, excuse me, Matthew 14, Jesus has been going 90 miles an hour. He's been healing the sick. He's been providing for people. He just fed the 5,000. And so quite honestly, he was exhausted. He was tired. He sent the disciples. He basically forced them, demanded that they get in the boat, go across, I'll catch up with you. And immediately Jesus was by himself. And what did he do? And we see in the scriptures that he, and he frequently did this. He spent time with his father. He spent time with God. 
He simply prayed, he was resting, he was focusing on his relationship with his father and just really getting rejuvenated and ready to go. So he gets recharged and refueled and he steps out onto the lake and he starts walking on the water towards the disciples. Now the other part of this that we need to know is the disciples have been approximately on the lake now in that storm for probably close to nine hours. So you can imagine they're exhausted, they're tired, they're even wondering what the heck is going on when all of a sudden they look up and they see off in the distance this figure that's heading towards them walking on the water in the middle of the storm. And they do what you and I would do. They freak out and they go, is that a ghost? It's exactly what I would do. Nobody's ever walked on the water before. Nobody's ever walked on the water since. And it happened there in that moment. And these disciples are in the midst of this nine-hour journey fighting this storm. And all of a sudden, they see this aberration in front of them, or what they think is a ghost. And it's Jesus. And Jesus yells out to them over the wind and the crashing of the waves, don't be afraid, it's me. And then we look in the scripture, verse 28 in Matthew 14. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. If it's you. Peter isn't sure, and because he's not sure, he's going to test and confirm that it is Jesus, and what I just said to you is the test. Tell me to come to you on the water. Now, in my opinion, that is not a great test. Anybody can fake being Jesus and say that word for word, pick a better test. But the reality was, Peter knew. If I'm getting out of the boat in a storm, in the middle of a storm, in the water and the waves, I've got to know, I've got to know that I know that I know that that is Jesus in front of me. I need absolute certainty. But not Peter. Because he knew, and if you're taking notes, this is point number one. Faith isn't certainty, but courage in the face of uncertainty. It was Labor Day, September 2010. Our son Grayson was starting to feel sick. And as any good mom would, Jill was just running through the battery of things that you do. You're checking to see, okay, what is it? Kids, kids run fever all the time. And, but something's different. It's just not changing. It's not getting better. I'm off with my other son. We're actually hosting an event for pastor's kids in another part of Oklahoma. And, um, and so Jill starts making appointments. The long and short of it is we end up, by October, we checked into OU Children's Hospital, um, which honestly became our home for a good year, uh, even a little bit longer than that. Gray had a port surgically inserted into his shoulder. He also received a pick line along with a feeding tube. He received six rounds of chemo, three weeks of radiation, a stem cell transplant, which lasted over 30 days. They were literally on lockdown for 30 days, my wife and Grayson were. They told us it would smell like opening up a can of sweet corn, and I thought, that's weird. And we got in there and started, and it smelled exactly like that. And now I don't eat a lot of uh, cream, I, sorry, I said sweet corn, cream corn. It smelled like cream corn. And I don't eat a lot of cream corn, but every time it comes around, which is not often, it reminds me of that moment. It smelled exactly like cream corn. Went through amino therapy. We finished all the treatments in October of 2011. There was now what they said was a 30% chance that the cancer would not come back within five years. So that's the really nice way of saying it. The negative way of saying it is you've got a 70% chance that this cancer is coming back within five years. If you can make it past the five-year mark, then your chances increase dramatically that your son is going to be okay. So can I tell you what I learned from all that? Is that certainty is a myth. I don't know that I've ever been certain about anything in my life if I really think about it. And I wonder if you could say the same thing. I think the only thing we could agree that, that is certain today is that OU football is always going to be great. <laughs> Amen. And yet we get caught up thinking that we have to be certain before we step into anything that faith means I'm certain of the outcome. That's not faith at all. In fact... If certainty were present, 
you wouldn't need faith at all. And if you're waiting for certainty before you take the step that the Lord is calling you to take, then you're going to be waiting for a long, long time. You don't have to be certain. You don't have to be confident of the outcome. You don't have to know how things are coming or going to turn out. But if God is calling you out of the boat onto the water, then step out and have faith, even when you're not certain. Peter gets a bad rap because of what comes next in the story. When he starts to sink, Jesus has to save him, reaches down and grabs his hand. Yes, he slipped, but he was the only one who had the faith to get out of the boat. I don't know what step of faith that the Lord is calling you to. I don't know if it's a new job that maybe isn't as much pay, but it's going to give you more time with your family. Maybe it's time to go ahead and commit to that. I don't know if it's a conversation that you've been needing to have for a while now that you've been, or, or that, but you've honestly been too afraid to have the conversation. Maybe it's time to have the conversation. I don't know if it's taking your next step and getting baptized or finding community here in a small group or serving on a team. Let's, let's, let's agree the boat, it's, it's always going to be safer, right? It's going to be safe in the boat. There's a lot of comfort in the boat. But if Jesus calls you out onto the water, are you willing to leave the comfort behind for your calling? You don't have to be certain to have faith. You don't have to be certain to have faith. So Jesus calls Peter out of the boat and onto the water and wouldn't you know it, just like that, Jesus, Peter starts walking on the water. We don't know how long he walked on the water. We don't know how many steps he took. We just know that he walked far enough to be close to Jesus, who was far enough out for the disciples not to be able to recognize him. Now, I hope you catch this next part. I think it's kind of important. Some people may tell you that faith is blind. They may say that following Jesus requires that you put aside your intellect, your gut, and that you have to ignore facts in order to live by faith. But Peter didn't need to be blind to walk on the water. He just had to keep his eyes on Jesus. Point number two, faith isn't blind, but keeping your eyes in the right place. Peter got his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. Matthew 14, verse 31. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Isn't that the other thing we struggle with is doubt? Doubt's a tough word. We struggle with it. We think it means we can never question that we, have to be, that we have to blindly follow Jesus with no room for doubt or questions. There's no room for that. We think for me to have faith, I can't let doubt creep in. And if I do, I have to ignore it. And eventually, hopefully, it will go away. The Greek word for doubt means to be divided. And that's exactly what happened to Peter. Peter's failure came from a divided focus. He was focused on the Lord. He was walking on the water. But what happened was he took his focus. He took his eyes off of the Lord. He got his eyes on the power of the storm instead of the power of Jesus. And that's when he began to sink. Some of our greatest moments as a family is being at home. I would say we are homebodies by nature. We love our home. We love going home. In fact, I'm already divided because my mind is halfway home because I'm in my pool already. I'm preparing to watch OU baseball tonight, so I'm halfway here and halfway out. I know that does not encourage you because I'm preaching today. It'll be okay. Loved our home. All kinds of great memories took place in our home. One of the memories with our son, we had a butterfly bush. And this butterfly bush was massive. And what it would do is it would have these blooms on it. And it would create this smell, this essence that it, it smelled great. But these monarch butterflies would just come around this thing. And they would just land on it. And they would get really calm and docile. I think that's the right word. I don't know if that sounds right. Just somebody shake their head at me. Yeah, that's the right word. Um, and... This monarch butter, they would just land on there. And so we'd take Grayson out there and, we'd, and he'd love those butterflies. And he would have me grab a butterfly. I'd pick it off and I'd show it to him and then I'd hand it to him. And then he would either do one of two things. He would rip the wing off and or he'd throw it on the ground and just stomp on it. 
Now, as a father, I was super proud. Because anytime you can cause mayhem and destruction to things, you just are proud as a dad. I don't know, is there like a group out there that goes after people who attack butterflies? Okay, I didn't mean that. We have all kinds of pictures. In fact, my wife wears a butterfly on her person every single day, whether it's a necklace or an earring or a piece of clothing. A lot of times you don't even see it. And she does that just in honor of our son. You could walk up to her now and go, where's your butterfly? And she would have something on that represents our son. There was one particular conversation that Grayson was having with my wife. We were at home. He was playing in the living room. She was in the kitchen. And he walked over to her. He really ran over to her. And he said, Mom, I want to go home. And she looks at him almost like a silly, bewildered look and says, well, Grayson, you are home. And he just smiled really big and ran back and started playing again. It must have been five, six minutes later. He comes running back in the room and he goes, Mama, I want to go home. And she pauses. She stops what she's doing this time and she makes eye contact with him. And, and as she's looking at him and about to tell him, it clicks in her head. I would call, I would say it was the Holy Spirit that was telling her in that moment, oh my gosh, he's not talking about here. He's talking about going to heaven. And she got choked up in that moment and she composed herself and she loved on him and he ran back in the other room and it was in that moment that she began to know something else was happening here in the midst of everything that we were dealing with. Getting our eyes in the right place isn't about ignoring the storm. We don't just close our eyes to the problems around us. We don't ignore our feelings or emotions or the impact of the wind just to pretend that everything is okay. But when it comes down to it, are you more concerned about the storm than you are confident in God's power over the storm? Now, here's what I know and I'm very confident in. God is greater than your storm. God is greater than your doubts. God is greater than your struggles and your pain, than your anxiety. The wind may be strong, but our God is stronger. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. So Peter gets his eyes off Jesus. He begins to sink. Jesus grabs him by the hand, pulls him up. And here's the next thing we see. Verse 32. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Point number three, faith isn't about the end result, but about walking with Jesus. It's never about the end result. It's just about a journey of walking with the Lord and keeping your eyes on Him. It's not about what I can get. It's not about what you can get. But it's about my relationship with Him. Listen, you want my advice as almost a 50-year-old man of how to raise kids? I'll give you two. Model for your kids faith, even when it's hard. And model for your kids keeping your eyes on Jesus no matter what. If you do those two things, your kids are gonna be fine. Because you're gonna give them something that no money will buy, no education can do, and you're gonna teach them. And that's why my son can stand on Wednesday nights and talk to junior high kids and be confident in his faith and trust in God because it was simply deposited in him and it was modeled in him. And I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to be boastful. I'm just telling you, we make it a lot harder than it is. We both knew Grayson was going to die. I did not want to have the conversation with her. Jill did not want to have the conversation with me. We were avoiding it, but we both knew that he was going to die. Somehow or another, we came together and had the conversation and we were on the same page and we knew that even though the world was praying, we had a prayer map that was online, Christy, and on that prayer map, it literally would light up. I mean, every few minutes, like this story had been carried around the world. Uh, uh, what's his name? Dr. Phil, fellow Oklahoman. Um, his wife picked up the story and put it out there and these people all over the world it's just lighting up. It's just this prayer map of people are praying, surely our son is going to be healed. But we knew even in the midst of that, that was not what was gonna take place. And you know what? We were gonna be okay. Grayson took his last breath on Mother's Day, May 13th, 2012. If you ever wonder why we're not around here Mother's Day, that's why we take off and we go be a family. And we just remember and, 
and love one another and just have a good time. In that moment was one of the most incredible moments I think I've ever experienced in my entire life. We had moved Grace into our bed. The hospice nurse was there and she was wonderful. She could tell us almost to the moment when he was gonna pass. And we came in there and we brought our youngest son or our oldest son, Seth, in there. and We said our goodbyes and we nestled up close to him and held his hand and we simply said, Grayson, it's okay. It's time for you to go be with Jesus. And can I tell you, I know that sounds horrible to maybe you, to the outside world, but it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible to know in the midst of absolute chaos that God was right in the middle of it. And I'm here to tell you today that God is right in the middle of your storm with you. Why couldn't Jesus have just been like, hey, wind, chill out, when he reached down to pick up Peter? Why couldn't he have just calmed everything down before they walked back to the boat? And I suppose if you don't get anything else, maybe get this. Because faith isn't about wishing away all our problems, but about trusting Jesus to walk with you through them. You think you don't have faith because you're still going through the storm? That's not true at all. Faith doesn't make all of life's problems go away. It simply rests in the fact that the Lord is with you every step of the way. The last verse, 33, then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Sorry, guys, I'm skipping around on my notes. And so if I'm confusing you back there, that's totally on me. I'm divided right now. I'm thinking about OU baseball and preaching. I got to win this game tonight. <laughs> the book of Matthew is all about proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one who was promised about in the Old Testament. He is God in the flesh. And he, his show of power over nature, by calming that storm, we see the proof that God truly has come. I suppose I'm gonna ask you to do something. Would you all make eye contact with me today? I'm just gonna look around this entire room. I'm gonna look at everybody as fast as I can. I'm gonna go up to the balcony now. It's awkward, but that's okay. I empathize, I, I empathize with your anger, with your pain, with your trust issues, even towards God. I empathize with that. I really do. I suppose I understand maybe a little bit differently just because of life experience. But this is my challenge to you today. Will you trust him even if the storm is still raging? And some of you, the storm is still raging right now. Will you trust him if he's calling you out onto the water? Will you trust him if you find yourself falling today because you've gotten off track? And will you trust him to reach down and pick you up? Paul in the Bible says this. I suppose I'll, I move back and forth between this being my favorite verse and others, but this is what Paul says in Romans chapter eight. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's super encouraging to me because there's still days I fight encouragement, but you know what it does? It actually puts all the onus back on me because I gotta choose to want to have Jesus in my life. It's taken more faith for me to have in trusting the Lord now than it did before when my son was alive. And it's not an easy journey, but it's worth it because God is faithful. I don't know where you're at today, but I do know this. We serve a God that we can trust and he's with you wherever you are. Let's pray. Father, you see us in our sin. You see us in our pain. You see us how we really are right now in this moment and you love us. God, would you help those that are struggling that are in the midst of the storm right now? Will you extend your hand and pick them up? Even if the storm has been caused by our own sin, 
I thank you, God, that you are faithful. I thank you that you show grace and mercy to us. Father, will you do right now what no one else can in the hearts of your people? Folks, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come and you can come down front and pray if you want to, but this could be one of those moments today that changes the rest of your life. I told you that if you can keep your eyes on Jesus and model faith for your kids, and if that's all you can do, your kids are gonna be pretty incredible. But first you have to know Jesus in order to do that. And today might be your moment to accept him as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today and you wanna accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm simply gonna ask you to slip up your hand right now. And we're gonna pray. If you're here today and you realize you've battled with this thing called faith and doubt, and you've not ever wanted to express those words that we've expressed today, and even wondering and the anger towards God, but you understand and know now that God is faithful and that it's a journey of faith. It's not just building up your faith and so that you can get things and you wanna draw closer to the Lord today. Would you slip up your hand? I wanna pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we bless you, we honor you. Touch your people's hearts today, God. Do what only you can do inside of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer team, would you come make your way to the front? Folks, I wanna encourage you, spend a little bit of time in worship today. Pray a prayer with these down front here. Allow your faith to be built, but realize this, that you're on a journey of faith. And it's not just one miraculous moment where you have great faith. It's a life that you build and that you walk with Jesus. Hey, thanks so much for jumping on our YouTube page. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here at Victory Family Church. This is my wife, Christy. Uh, I just want to say welcome to the family. We talk about family a lot here. Now you're a part of the family on YouTube. And so hopefully the content here will help you, challenge you, encourage you, and maybe make you laugh a little bit. So uh, subscribe. We'd love to have you. Uh, have an awesome day.